thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you today and engage you in an opportunity to save lives. I'm a neuroscientist and the daughter of an architect, and I want to tell you why, after many years, after my PhD and taking up clinical practice, I went back to school and got my master's in architecture so that I could join you in saving lives by design. We have all felt the influence of natural and built places on our psyche, on our emotions, and on our behavior. Whether it's the constellations in the sky above or the ceiling and geometries of the Alhambra Palace, we've all felt the emotional changes and sometimes behavioral and physical changes that design can exert upon us. In fact, 100% of the hundreds of people that I've lectured to have all said that they've had this experience. And will you indulge me in an experiment and raise your hand if you've ever felt or behaved differently because of where you were? OK, I'm counting, and I want to know who that person over is. I'll talk to you afterwards, OK? <laughs> but the interesting thing is that if you can feel it, the chances are we can measure it in your brain, in your body, and in your behavior. And the secret is, it's not just subjective. It's biological as well. It's subjective and objective. It's psychological and it's physiological. And why is it that we want to know this? Why would we want to harness what we've been measuring with neuroscience for decades now to inform the design of a space? Well, it happens that that biological impact really matters. This is who it matters to. Imagine holding a tiny newborn baby connected to a tangle of tubes in intense lighting in the neonatal intensive care unit with a cacophony of sounds blaring around that baby. That's what a neonatal intensive care unit is like. Imagine watching the doctors disentangle that baby and carry him over to the window in the hopes that they can see a more natural skin tone because that's the signal that the liver might be functioning and there might be hope. That was my baby. That's the environment where I was. There was nothing about the design of this space that said we're here to support the work of health. There was no place for rest or respite or reflection. There was no place for the introvert concentrating on the task at hand of saving that baby. There was no place for the conversation of collaboration. And there was no place to retreat when things didn't go well. Nonetheless, Lives are saved in these environments every day. But unfortunately, errors happen. And what we need to do is demand that our design supports what we actually do, what we have to perform, whether we're in a hospital, an educational setting, a gym, or a spiritual space. And a hospital is a microcosm of all of that. So recent studies by the leading institutions around the world and in the United States have shown the scale of this problem. If we were able to reduce the hospital-acquired events, serious adverse events or deaths that occur in hospitals every year in the United States, if we could only take it down 40% in three years, we could save. 60,000 lives in three years. We could save 1.8 million people from having a serious event at a cost of up to $35 billion. Over 10 years, it's projected in the range of 50 for Medicare, 50 billion. So it's real. We can make a change, and people are watching. The World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control, these numbers come from our institutions that are now tracking across the globe 
the serious issue we have at hand. And if design could only change 1%, we would save thousands of lives. So let's explore how we might do that. So we can do that with some really cool technologies. So here I am standing inside of a virtual reality cave. So it's a 20 foot high surround projection in which I can stand inside of a protein molecule. Or I can stand inside of a building. Or I can stand inside of a full urban scale environment and understand how we move and interact with space. And we've been developing new softwares so that we can do the impossible. In real time, we can test design. And here's my colleague walking on a Mobius, inside of a 3D Mobius. And what we're coming to understand is how the geometries and shapes impact how he feels, how he moves, what his balance system is doing, and where his eyes are fixing. Well, whereas that might be a great deal of fun in an impossible environment, we can also have fun in hospitals. So the question is, how do we bring in more technology? How do we bring in really high-tech things like a disco ball? And what does it have to do with rocket science? Well, it transpires that fall risk is one of our greatest growing problems. And yet, we know how to design for that. In Massachusetts alone, a recent study showed an increase of 143 to 177% in falls in patients who were 65 or 85 years old. Traumatic brain injury and death occurs with falls. We know that. So why do we need a disco ball? Well, we use a disco ball to disrupt the visual field, to create a specular image so that you no longer know where visual vertical is. And once we've done that, then we can see which of your balance organs is out. Well, it just so happens that this technology is a benefit of the dollars that we spent with NASA as they were learning how to understand which astronauts might respond with space sickness or might have asymmetrical vestibular processes. And so that bit of neuroscience helps us to understand how to design spaces for a very broad range of users, not just our greatest and brightest, but an entire range of needs. Because within the medical and clinical arena, we think about all. We think about the most gifted and the most fragile. We can measure you as you're encountering this. So here I've got an electrode array on the brain of actually one of our coders who created the virtual model that he's in so that we could find out whether or not he would admit to being lost. Actually, it was a larger experiment than that. It really matters if you're lost in a hospital. Are you running to the emergency unit and lost and you are going to see your loved one or you're a doctor? Have you missed the signs and you're now wa wandering down the surgical suite when you shouldn't be. There's a huge cost and a huge, huge risk to infection if we don't know where we are. We can see the difference in your parietal lobe that measures and indicates your orientation to the world. And that helps us to know whether or not you're lost or are finding your way. What you see matters more than just where you are. Light entrains your biology. The impact of light on health has been understood for over 60 years. We have strong, rigorous research that's within the tomes of the neurosciences. It needs to be translated into terms that a designer can use because the impact is real. We have epidemiological studies indicating a relationship between the amount of light and darkness you receive and cancer rates and heart rates and depression and mood and performance. We can measure this and guess what? We can fix this. We know 
how to manipulate light. The secret is one light bulb does not fit all and we can demand light for people. Here we measured heart rate variability with two different spectra of light. And what you see is a highly significant difference with that little star up there that says it was a very low probability we got this wrong. But when bathed in red light versus a bright white light with blue in it that stimulates melatonin, heart variability changed. And so it relaxed when it was meant to, it engaged during a memory task, and it relaxed again when the person was no longer doing a task. What this simple graph says is we have to design according to our biological need for light, in addition to our need to see. So I'm standing inside of my cave, looking through two windows, in a, in a surgical acute unit, a post-surgical unit, where one or two nurses sit. And I'm looking at the two patients. And I'm in one-to-one -one scale here. The building is the actual size, even though it's vertical. And I'm trying to understand if I can see everything I need to see from this nursing station before we build a 10-story tower with hundreds of beds in it. And what we discovered was, I couldn't see the head wall with all the vital equipment over the patient on the right. That matters. That saves lives. We change geometry. We design change that will save lives. But there's another problem. There's something called look-alike, sound-alike medication errors. And the problem is that there is a long list of medications that sound the same. And it really matters if you can't hear the doctor ordering adrenaline and give the doctor aspirin. And so there's been a national list for many years, and this is now recognized worldwide, that we have to do something to help us to see. And guess what? We can save life with a light bulb. It's so reassuring to have gone from clinical service to architectural design and realize we are saving thousands of lives at a time. Not one patient at a time, but a building takes care of thousands at a time. And here, this is the cabinet. It's a very poor photograph because it was dark in there. It had 20% of the light needed for a normal subject to read. And these are where the medications are distributed that are very unusual. They're not at the emergency bed. They're in a distribution area where they have a door and the nurse closes the door to concentrate, to ensure that the correct drug is being given. 20% of the light needed to read by a normal subject. Do you know what a normal subject is? It is a 20-year-old Psych 101 student. <laughs> and our nursing demographic is aging. And even if it isn't, we all have different lighting needs. And we all have individual lighting that can be introduced into our built environment if we demand, and if we share, and if we explain what it is that we do in our complex lives. It also matters what we hear. We're going to do another experiment. So there are look-alike and sound-alike medication errors. And if only the average hospital environment was this quiet. But it's not. It's filled with competing yet vital noises. The ventilation system, the voices, filtering over the wall from the room next door, an upset patient, the sound of the EKG alarm. So I'm going to play the EKG and all of the alarms, the cacophony of sounds, and um, see if you can tell me what the doctor is ordering. I'll give you a clue. The doctor's ordering two medications. OK, let's see. If you can tell what medicines they are, please raise your hand.
this is, this is the actual sound level that you're not going to hear because what you'll see in the blue lines is that the sound level in the ICU is below 80 decibels, which is good. That keeps from noise-induced hearing loss. But that's an average sound level. If you look at the green bars, that's when I turn my system to measure impulse noise, such as an EKG alarm or an ambulance outside or the crashing of instrumentation. And that reaches at shift change when every person is speaking to every other person coming on shift. So you may have 40 people speaking above the level of the EKG alarm. It reaches between 110 and 120 decibels. That's the level of a jet engine. Voices, normal voices, are between 45 and 65 decibels. Is it any wonder we have to do something to help people? Let's see if you can hear these medications being ordered by a doctor in the sound field. Anybody recognize the medications? No? Charles, what was that sound level? That was about 80. 80 dB? OK, that was quite a loud sound level. Sorry if I surprised you. That was 20 decibels below, and that's a logarithmic scale. OK? Now, we're going to take away all the competing sounds, and at the same sound level, you're going to hear the voice of just the doctor giving orders. I promise I didn't do anything funny in there to make it easier. But you'll see the impact of adverse events may occur when Celebrex is confused with Cerebex in some patients. Can anybody hear the medications? All right. Can anybody tell me what they were? Celebrex. Thank you. Thank you. How much easier it would be if we designed for sound? Charles, did you grab that sound level? Uh, it was about 65. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So we know if we collaborate, we can make real changes. We know we can save lives. And some of it is easy to do and not expensive to do. And we have the materials and the technology and the understanding in design. What we need is the team. We need the team to work together to create change. And you're part of that team. Because you need to be aware of design's impact on you. And you need to share that information with the people who impact your lives. And we, the people, can demand design for health. And we can empower design. Thank you very much.